So in practice, the source of the internal QC performed in my serology lab is from, and if you don't know, you can guess. We'll have some non-answers, but uh, okay. A mix of in-kit controls and independent third-party controls. Which QC rules do you use in your serology lab? Okay, about the same number of respondents. A mix, mostly quantify QC data and Levy Jennings charts, along with WestGuard multi rules. With respect to serology, how is a new reagent lot validated in your lab? So we have a good solid 54 people that are choosing to answer these questions. 55. Okay, using third party independent controls, cross over the old and new reagent lot. Opinion was the ideal positive control material. Okay, both two and three. Strongly positive QC material and weakly positive QC material. Okay, for this next section, one of the things in the, in the previous, uh, previous years of this meeting was that, with that uh, some of the feedback was that we didn't spend enough time looking at some of the qualitative and semi-quantitative testing and some of the unique quality control challenges uh, in, in that environment. We had a working group last year and, and we had a di very divergent opinions, of people from, uh, from all over and, uh, and, and the group really had a difficult time coming to any kind of conclusions but was sharing their, their best practices. So we wanted to keep this, um, this concept going and so for our first speaker, I'll invite uh, Dr. Barak, who's general manager of the Central Lab in Haifa and Western Galilee in Israel. Thank you. Thank you very much, Barry Wright, for inviting me to be here and to speak about the topic that I have raised uh, two years ago in a BioRad meeting. And special thanks to Gianni that for the full support that I am get getting from him every time that I need something. And now uh, I would like to take the audience a little bit to uh, sail uncharted waters, a little bit uncharted waters of uh, quality control in uh, semi-quantitative assays in serology and immunology. I'm not, not going to speak about blood bank because my colleague will continue with the blood bank. 
Uh, I'm fully aware that the audience, it's most of the audience, is in clinical chemistry and the hospital. I'm going to speak about a regional laboratory This is in the northern part of Israel. A few introductory words about the, health, the Israeli healthcare system. It's not going on. No. Okay. In Israel, the participation in the insurance medical plan is compulsory. It's the insurance law. And in Israel, we're spending about 8% of our GDP on health. Uh, for example, in France and Germany, it's about 11 to 12%. In the States, 15 to 17%. It, dep it depends if it's WHO data or OECD. In Israel, it's only 8%. But all Israeli citizens are entitled to the same uniform basket. Benefit package, package is a basket. And in, among all the... Uh, Goods in this basket is also the laboratory tests. In Israel, we have four HMOs, and Clarit Health Services, whom I serve, is the biggest HMO in Israel. It comprises about 56% of the population. We have three regional and 11 mm -hmm. hospital laboratories. In our uh, northern part of Israel, we have a, a my laboratory is the second biggest laboratory in Klalit. It serves about 800,000 outpatients, over 20, uh, 220 <coughs> clinics, and over uh, 1,600 physicians. We are getting 14,000 samples per day, and last year we have performed 19 million tests. It's a multidisciplinary laboratory which has inside the microbiology, hematology, biochemistry, uh, tumor markers, immunology, serology, and endocrinology as well. We were the first laboratory ISO certified, in, clinical laboratory ISO certified in Israel in 1998. Our mission is overdoing um, more than 80,000 serology immunology tests uh, and re results per month to do it with all the quality that we can do, because quality is in our blood and other specimens as well. And we would like very much to make hot couture in spite of the mass production that we are doing. How we are performing it? This is a, a little bit of the panel of the serology immunology. And I don't want you un to, to read all it's stated here. Why it is? Okay, but what I want just to emphasize is that there are here a, a test that are mo that half of the tests are a sample to cut off quantitative tests or semi-quantitative tests, and the part of them are also quantitative tests. But in my opinion, even if those are half quantitative and half qualitative tests, they can be dealt with quality control the same, because even a, a qualitative test, it has a number behind it. And we can use all the rules, most of the rules that we can use in clinical chemistry. We are using the usual plot, of course, and we have used it for a lot of time, putting inside the in-kit control and the third-party control, and making a lot of Levy Jennings charts and Excel sheets and so on and so on. But it's for such a, a, a large panel of tests, it's very, very difficult. Unity Real-Time QC has proven to us as a big advantage, not because I'm speaking here in a meeting of BioRad, but it's a, real, a really tremendous improvement in our work. Since the results are for the serology immunology are online, we have used it for a lot of time in chemistry, but for serology it's a big improve. There are all the results on right, online. We can use different QC materials and levels, as I'll show you afterwards. We can set our reject and warning rules depending on the analyte, and not all the analytes are the same. We can put inside the chart all the remarks that we want, the maintenance services, and so on. The harmonization is very, very important for serology immunology. Harmonization between units of the same instrument, 
or harmonization be between analyzers, because you can imagine with such a high number of tests, we have to have several units or several analyzers from the same brand name. Of course, harmonization per method or peer group, whatever you want to use, and set, we can set our analytical goals, and they are different for each test, and all the documentation, the reports that are really, really available. It's just looking very frightening, but uh, frankly speaking, we don't have to upgrade our brains in order to be compatible with this computerization, because I think it's very, very friendly used. What we are using in the day-to-day -day, uh, work? We are, we are using just as a stop rule, the 1-3-S, and as a trend, the 7 trend, it, it, uh, for most of our tests. There are tests that we are using the 1-2-S two, or 2-2-S, two, two but most of them are the 1-3-S and 7 trend. And we have decided that with a lot of experience and data, there is no use to, there's no benefit to use very sophisticated uh, uh, rules. It's very important, however, to, uh, to, to make all the controls and all the, all the graph and to archive all the QC data, because retrospectively we, we are getting a lot of information in serology immunology. And there are also additional tools that we, are, we implement in day-to-day -day use. What are the uh, special as aspects of QC in serology? Of course, you are all aware that there are negative results and even below cutoff controls that we have to deal with. There are problems with the cutoff themselves because we are rendering false negative or false positive results. That it means it's yes or none results, not, not a quantitative result. And their clinical relevance because of the improper cutoff has been, can be tremendous. In part of our essay, there are crude calculations, sample to cutoff, and since it is a ratio, each of part of this ratio, or the sample on the cutoff, can change by themselves. And we have to take in, in, in account the, the, the ratio between them and to give, for example, a qualitative result. As we have dealt with in the last BioRAD um, uh, uh, conference last year, there are no standards. Most, most, most of the tests are not standardized. And when you, you have no standard, the bias is very, very difficult to find it. And there are, mo there are a lot of tests that are in arbitrary units and not international units. And if I'm speaking about, about biological variation, it's a very, very big issue in, in this uh, uh, test. For example, if uh, the cutoff for CMV IgG is seven international units, and the person has got her first result at 10, and afterwards she's rechecked and she's getting a 15. Is 15 what it is? Is it a, a, a reinfection, reactivation, or is it just the biological variation of this, the same 10 that she has got before? No data about it. If we just want to implement the CV of total IgG on this specific IgG, it will be useless because the biological variation of IgG is about 5%. It's not, it's not useful in this context. Also from the last meeting from BioRAD, we know that about the problem of the lack of standards from the point of technical and financial problems. From, there are a regional epidemiological variation for some antigens, therefore the standard from one part of the world, it will not be the same as in the other part of the world. There are old standards that have to be renewed, for example, measles, mumps, and so on. Uh, this, the standard should include diagnostically relevant isotypes, because if there you have a standard with only for IgG, it will not be in any context with IgM and IgA. Uh, it's a problem to find the right donors for the standards because, as you know, there are cross-reactions. If we um, uh, check for CMV and, and EBV can sh show a positive signal as a, a cross-reaction, it's, right, it's not the right donor for this standard, of course. 
and there, are, there is almost no harmonization between different technical platforms. Uh, it was proposed that the molecular assay could be a, a standards for the serology, but as you well know, this, there are diff tremendous differences between molecular assays and, and serological assays, and they cannot be interchangeable. Then we are using in-kit controls and independent third-party controls, and when the controls are very far away from the clinical decision point, there is no other, other means but to in introduce Pulsera with all the drawbacks that we know that you have with Pulsera. But this year, these are the real controls for different kinds of assays. I'm not going to elaborate a lot about the, the, this graph that all of them, of all of you are using, but in serology, immunology, the changing the imprecision from 5% to 10% it will be very, very influential, at, at least in the borderline patients, those that are in, uh, during the seroconversion phase, and it, it will be much more critical for them. What I'm meaning by seroconversion, this is the graph for, of HSV, as you can see, and the, the, this is the seroconversion panel, when you can see that IG, IgM is increasing and the IgG is increasing from a state that the patient has not HSV before it. But it's not so easy just to, to make all the statistics on the points of, of this graph because it's not just increasing and that's that. It can be a, a part that is past infection of reactivation. The IgG, which is supposed to remain high, can go lower. What it will be from the statistical point of view? What the patient or the, or the doctor can be consulted on these topics? It's very difficult about it. And then we have to introduce in our system of quality control specific important sera. I'm sure that each laboratory putting aside different sera that are very, very important for themselves or seroconversion panels obtained in the laboratory or um, um, by the manufacturers. They are both by the manufacturers because those can give us an additional information in, on those type of assays that are very, very tricky. About the gray zone, as you know, the imprecision should be a, a lower than the gray zone. For example, if there is a cutoff is one, plus minus 0.1, the imprecision should be lower than 10%, but very few serological assays have such an imprecision. Uh, we are tending to use those assays that, that have imprecision of less than 10%, but in different topics you are allowing also imprecision of 20% because you don't have any other choice. Often the CV can help for, to define the gray zone, and if we are increasing the, the gray zone, it's better then to categorize the, the patient with a misclassification. As I have already mentioned, there are, for several of the tests, there is no standard, no reference analyzer. Is the most prevalent method something that can use us? All methods mean can, can be useful for us, and therefore we are using the external quality control for those, for those questions. But even the external quality control, it's not such useful. For example, I have, I have here an example for, from Miquas, for CMV IgG also, and the most prevalent um, analyzer that it's used is the VIDAS, you can see, and the inten intended result was a negative one, but even with the VIDAS, we are getting false positive results. The, the, it's uh, the most used instrument, and it's regarded as a, a, the a gold standard. Another example, for, from, for example, for Pertuzzi's IgM. We have in our RCPA external quality control, there were only four laboratories reporting to give negative and two positive results. Since RCPA is very, very uh, um, useful for us because of their comment and interpretation, we have learned that there is the PERT group in Germany that have introdu introduced this algorithm for performing the um, um, diagnosis, serological diagnosis 
for uh, pertussis. And we are using it with the IgG and IgA, but not IgM at all. But reading carefully the, inst the, the instructions from RCPA, you can see that there is no gold standard for ortella pertussis. There is no consensus on the role of serology. Uh, the sero convention uh, is significant when you, only when you have a pair of uh, a, a, a test, and the, the CDC does not include at all antibody testing, but isolation of the bordetella pertussis or PCR for bordetella pertussis. Therefore, all this serology is questionable. And I have shown you all, already the antibody kinetics. Once there is only IgD and IgM, for example, for EGV, <coughs> but there are also another anti antibodies that are for uh, EBNA, for example, or uh, avidity of antibodies that they can put in our frame the time of infection. And here, the, the quality control is very, very crucial. It's very, very important. So each reagent lot can show day by day, day small variation, and new lot reagent can show even a stronger variability. Since we know that two different lot of reagents may satisfy internal or external quality control, but with the given performance in the direct, direct impact, give give that different performance with direct impact on patient outcome. Therefore, we are go going to the next step of QC on patient's level. Since the QC material, even handled in a proper manner, it's not the real thing, and it, has, it, it, it doesn't have any pre-analytical problem, it's not the best predictor to QC problems. I'm just... I'm uh, going to show you a graph of the lot to lot variation uh, based on the number of positive results on uh, our tests for two lot numbers, as you can see here. The, 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 the first lot, num uh, lot number was uh, uh, 19114, and the median positive result was 10%, and the second one, 1650, and this is the median positive results based on, uh, on our uh, uh, patient's results. The difference is between 10% positivity and uh, a mean of 20% positivity. Just image to yourself that I'm giving positive results of CMV for 10% of our uh, uh, women that are uh, uh, checked, or afterwards we are, we are giving to 20%. It's a tremendous difference. But we have to take in consideration that we have to have big numbers of results in order to see those statistics on the level of the patients, the positivity of the patients. Of course, we have to take in consideration that there are seasonal fluctuations that can influence those numbers. Then which QC material to adopt? As a rule in our laboratory, we are adapting each of them that I have spoken about, and we have to to see that there is a trade-off between the a, a quick a error detection and probability to take the right decision. At the first place, calibrator is not a QC, but in kit controls, it's a just a, a quick error detection, but the probability of a right decision is not so high. Then we are going to the pulse and to the third part party a control that it, a, a, it's a quick error detection, but also the probability of right detection is medium. And then we are going to the, the, the zero conversion panels that, is, that are expensive. We, we cannot use them each day, but when we have problems or new uh, instruments that are installed, the external quality controls that can uh, uh, give us a, a, a high probability of uh, right high probability to take right decision, but the detection error is very, very slow. And then the patient's results that I think that are most of all very, very useful in uh, terms of serology, immunology. As I have already told you, we think that um, the quality control in serology, immunology remains a little bit of art and not so science. 
Thank you. Thank you. Our next presenter is uh, Dr. Anne-Marie Van Veen. Uh, Anne-Marie Van Veen works as a clinical microbiologist in the Netherlands. She's worked for a number of years in the academic clinical virology department, and which is the basis of her experience in serology. She's chairman of the quality committee of NVMM, the Dutch Association for Medical Microbiology. Welcome, Dr. Van Veen. Thank you. Thank you. So, First, I would like to thank the organizing committee, BioRed, for inviting me to participate in this uh, interesting meeting. And um, uh, I'd like to, uh, to share some thoughts and experience about serology in medical microbiology laboratories. So, when I started to prepare my presentation, I realized that actually I took the wrong title. I was uh, actually uh, wanted to make it a risk management uh, in infectious disease serology in medical microbiology laboratories. And risk management was a concept which was very nicely presented by Jim Nichols in last uh, uh, expert meeting. And it is referred to in the new ISO 15189 uh, document. And it is more elaborated and more profoundly uh, worked out in the CLSI uh, EP23 uh, uh, guideline. And this approach to quality control is very much like uh, my own experience in working in medical microbiology as a clinical microbiologist. I think actually my work for, uh, for the most part is risk reduction in uh, infectious diseases. So it feels very familiar. And what appeals to me is that you build your control program on the basis of your um, uh, on your risk assessment in your uh, context. And that means that every laboratory makes an individual uh, assessment and makes an, their individual choices. There's no mandatory from uh, central or national parties. So let me give you a brief introduction and then I will show you two examples uh, in a serology laboratory about risk assessment. I'm sorry. So the concept of risk and risk management. In laboratory medicine, we are extremely risk averse and focus on the downsides of uh, effects of risk. And that is contrasting the man on the left, upper left. He is walking on a court without any safety measures. And risk actually is part of the game here. So it's a positive, uh, uh, positive experience. And also in business, Actually, risk is not only a downside effect, but it's also an opportunity, an opportunity uh, to uh, have a, a chance for a better or more successful business. And if you are, as a business, too much risk, of, too risk averse, then actually you miss out on your opportunities and you may stay behind uh, your, competition, your competitors. So risk averse, but in our uh, setting, in our laboratory, uh, it is essentially the potential for an erroneous result, so it's narrowed down to an erroneous result or delayed result or the non-delivery of a result. And risk management is a systematic process of risk identification. You have to see your, your risk, you have to identify them. Risk analysis, you have to uh, assess the probability of the likelihood of the risk occurring, the impact when it occurs, and the proximity, and the proximity states for the time interval where the risk may occur, and that's your risk, op yeah, that's your window of opportunity actually. In laboratory medicine, the last part, proximity, you don't see that uh, in, uh, included in your risk management, uh, uh, risk management process. Then you have uh, a risk response planning, what are you going to do when it's occurring, uh, which corrective and preventive measurements can you make, and then you have to monitor your risk and see uh, if your plan and if your measure, uh, measures are uh, effective. And monitoring risk can be through uh, your complaints registration, through your reruns you have to do, and things like that. So risk should be documented and you have to make it very specifically and uh, explicitly how you uh, define your risk. And it has a condition, a cause, a consequence, and a context. And you can say there is a risk that caused by resulting in. So, 
So if you look at the EP23 on uh, laboratory uh, cont quality control uh, from a risk management purview, then uh, they state that you should start with uh, your process, you make, make a map of your process and then make a map of the entire process. Of course, this is not a, map, a process map. A process map is much more complex. I think you saw one earlier uh, yesterday. Uh, but the entire process, meaning pre-analysis, pre pre analysis and post-analysis, and I mean here also the pre-pre and the post-post. So that's, for me, that's one. And uh, when you make your process thoroughly, then uh, a useful tool to analyze your risk and to see what cause and effect are is a fishbone diagram. And actually, I picked this one from the EP23, which is an example, not all inclusive, uh, and it uh, simply states which parts of your uh, process may result in an incorrect uh, test result. So you look at your sample, your operator, your laboratory environment. And this is very, this is <coughs> narrowed down to the analysis process, as you can see. So now, if you want to know more about this, so about this then I advise you to go to the EP23, it's very uh, interesting, or to general risk management uh, theories. So I will now try to uh, show you the concept uh, with a few, two serology examples. So this is a hepatitis C serology, probably familiar to you, and it's used as a screening assay in order to identify patients who have encountered a hepatitis C virus infection or those who have not. And this is the, uh, the scheme which is used in uh, most laboratories, in the Netherlands at least, if it's uh, a negative, then it's finished, and if it's positive or uh, a gray zone or indeterminate, then you have to do a blood confirmation, which can either be positive, in, indifferent, or negative again. So, if you want to do it correctly, you should make a process map, you make a fishbone uh, diagram. I'm not going to do that now, I'm going to show you a little bit more about the analysis process. So. These are, uh, what you see here is, it was the green button, yeah. What you see here is the uh, sample cutoff ratio of an uh, uh, ELISA we used on a fully automated platform. And this is the sample sequentially, so uh, in, in, in the time of about six months. And you see we have, uh, most of them are negative, uh, which is normally, and uh, a number of them are positive, or, uh, and uh, some of them are indeterminative. So specifications of the test by the manu manufacturer are uh, less than 0.8 is negative, uh, between 0.8 and 1 it's uh, indeterminate, and above 1 it's positive. And the range is below uh, 0.02 or above 11. So what you, in, in serology now the, there, are, there are more risks than this one, but there's one big, two big risks, and the first risk is that you say uh, somebody is positive while truly negative or somebody is negative while truly positive. Well, looking at uh, the, the flow of uh, a serum uh, diagnosis in our laboratory, actually in this setting I'm most interested in those uh, uh, samples that are negative while actually positive, or truly positive. So this is my risk, because then I will say that patients who are actually HIV positive are, neg uh, I say it's negative, and they are uh, withhold it then from uh, the, uh, the, the right therapy or they are withhold it from supportive actions. So that is a risk with a direct uh, impact on patient care. And in the, the, the way I, we build the, the, the uh, serology process, maybe it's less interesting if it's a, a false positive, if it's a false posi if it's a positive result while well, truly negative, because I've built in a few steps afterwards to control that risk. Of course, if you look at costs, it's very interesting to look at false positive also. So if cost is in, uh, uh, incorporated in your risk analysis, then maybe you want to do something about it. So what I want to say here is that if it's if your focus is on preventing uh, false negative, then in your risk assessment, you, maybe you want to have more control on this lower level, on your cutoff level. 
And so this may be a reason to choose, for example, quality control measures that are low in your uh, cutoff sample, sample cutoff ratio. <coughs> or maybe you, make, you can build in other uh, controls. So let me show you the next slide because this, oh, it's the wrong one. Because here you see the positive and the indeterminate results and what, uh, what the uh, outcome was of a confirmation. And the uh, green dots are all true positives. They were confirmed positive. The uh, red dots are all false positive. They were confirmed negative in the immunoblot. And the yellow ones were uh, lost from follow-up, three of them. And what you see here is that actually in, our, uh, in, in this setting, all our uh, samples who are above 11 sample cutoff ratio are positive. So now there's a discussion going on. So should we uh, say that all samples above 11, we just say, okay, it's a positive uh, result and we're not going to confirm it. Well, that changes my risk assessment actually, because now I'm going to say to a number of samples which are uh, positive, to the patient, you are HCV, HCV, hepatitis C virus positive. And still, even in this setting, although I have a totally green line in the upper part, it's about 97 uh, samples, still I have the risk of saying uh, to a patient, you are hepatitis C virus positive, well actually he might be true ne truly negative. That's the error I still have. So what my impact so what I changed in my protocol has impact on my risk assessment. For now, I am thinking about uh, how should I control this error of uh, false, uh, uh, falsely accusing somebody of having hepatitis C virus when he's above 11. And I can make several measurements. For example, I can choose a cut of control. Uh, uh, I can choose a control sample, which is in the high end, the upper end of my uh, ELISA. So I can see if stability of the ELISA in the high end is really uh, 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 of a proper condition. I can also uh, make uh, a very huge analysis, analysis with other laboratory, and I can see from that analysis that the likelihood of that uh, actually event occurring is very, very, very low. And then in that assessment, I can say based on the likelihood of a very, very low occurrence, well, maybe I should I can limit my uh, control measures for my risk assessment is rather low still. So what I wanted to point out is that risk assessment is related to your clinical decision point and your own context. So let me show you another ex example. So this is cytomegalovirus serology. And uh, you saw, saw it also by, in uh, Dr. Barak's uh, um, presentation. You see here an IgM G and an IgM. IgM is disappearing, and sometimes it can be a little bit up rising. And IgG is uh, supposed to be positive uh, for your lifetime. Well, at this mo that point, I was working in an academic laboratory, and we were doing IgG testing for cytomegalovirus for hematology patients. And the reason for that was that they were worked up for a transplantation, a matched unrelated donor transplantation, and they had to know uh, the CMV status of this patient and of the donor. And uh, we were uh, called uh, by, the, um, by the hematologists, so listen, we have a problem. We cannot make a decision with your data. We see patients who are going everywhere. So we looked at, and this is an example of uh, such a patient, and uh, they were puzzled, and we were uh, puzzled as, as well, of course, but because what you see here, that this is a patient A, and in time, with the same test, you can see it's positive, he's negative, uh, he's positive again, indeterminate, and negative again. So this goes all the way. So what is the CMV status of this patient now? And we were puzzled because we actually, it's an academic laboratory, we have three tests to analyze IgG, and uh, even with using three tests, we did not manage to sometimes to uh, make a proper, uh, um, take a proper result. So a man with two watches of obviously doesn't know how late it is. So in this case, it was two, that was the case too. 
So our explanation for this effect actually was that uh, there was waning immunity because of their underlying disease uh, condition. Um, there was uh, a transient IgG because of uh, blood transfusions or IV intravenous immunoglobulin uh, uh, they had. And um, that was all searched out and some patients could be explained by that, some not. And of course, being here, there's a very bad uh, serology test which uh, needs uh, some uh, uh, improvement. That's also a possibility. But what I want to show you is that based on a single point CMV IgG uh, measurement, we made some serious conclusions about the CMV status which had uh, an impact on patient uh, uh, policy. And actually, in this setting, it was very important to have a very good idea about what's going on here. And uh, in our setting, we uh, try to manage this risk by uh, uh, changing our uh, serology protocol. We included an extra test. We made it uh, from a fully automated uh, CMV IgG serology test. We, when it was indeterminate or we did not really, were not really sure, we made an, uh, another, uh, another ELISA test, which was uh, manual. But, or, but we could also, of course, and maybe we should have done that in, at that time. Now we're going to do it. <laughs> uh, we could have uh, changed our quality control samples, make the test more robust, um, narrow down uh, quality uh, uh, criteria of acceptance. We've seen, after these days, we've seen several measurements you can take to make your test more uh, uh, reliable. So, actually, in this case, we uh, did a very an, another exercise, another risk analysis, and that was based uh, that was initiated by the hematology uh, department together with us, and that was um, a health failure mode and effect analysis. We called it in the Netherlands a safer, but it, the international word is. Uh, HFMEA. And actually, that is a risk analysis, uh, which is uh, tuning into the process. It, you map your process, and then you make a risk analysis. You assess your, the risk which are uh, uh, connected, associated with the various steps. And it was a very uh, intriguing uh, exercise, actually. And uh, I, I hope I have the ability, the time and the, uh, the, the chance to do it more often because it was very learningful uh, for both the clinicians and for us. For it really opened our eyes about how uh, clinicians were working with our data and it opened um, also the clinicians' eyes about how we were working with their materials. And actually, this was not a a department we, where we did not have any connection with. We were there daily on phone, and we had our weekly. Uh, we had a weekly uh, uh, meeting, so we were. We knew them all, and we were really involved. But even then, you still see this uh, tremendous, uh, tremendous effect. So this is uh, just to show you what a chart looks like of uh, such a uh, uh, health failure mode and effect analysis. And if you cannot read it, it's in Dutch. But uh, I just wanted to show you, you make a risk analysis. And it, the results were actually shocking for us. For, uh, we found out that donor samples of these patients were submitted to the lab under the identification number of the patient. So, we did not always knew whether it was a patient sample or a donor sample. And in IgG, I mean, it can be positive or negative, so there were donor samples with IgG positive between them. And then the second step was that their IgG results from their laboratory information system were directly important in their patient registration system they used from some uh, European registration uh, um, uh, uh, system. And every new CMV IgG we were reporting was uh, uh, overruling the previous CMV IgG. And then uh, we came to the conclusions that clinicians were wrongly, uh, that CMV IgG levels were wrongly interpreted by clinician. And that was, although we placed a, f uh, a, f a perfect report under it that results were indeterminate, we couldn't say whether the CMV status was either positive or negative. They simply did not uh, read it. 
So we made several, <coughs> I'm sorry, we made several uh, adjustment, corrective actions, and preventive actions. Of course, directly we went to a unique patient registration that, that is simply not allowable. Um, and furthermore, we uh, disconnected our list with their uh, um, uh, registration uh, uh, system and made it a manual uh, insert for uh, their uh, nurses. And secondly, uh, we discussed how we were going to uh, go on when we were having trouble with interpreting the results. Okay, make a phone call, make a phone call to the to the doctor, and in an academic hospital that can be uh, difficult, to the doctor who is really in charge of the patient, and uh, discuss with him or her uh, what the CMV status was, and then uh, make it uh, uh, a note in the patient record. So if you, this is what happened in our situation, but if you look at, for example, CMV IgG in, an, in a an, uh, primary lab, they don't encounter these kind of patients, far less. In a normal immune patient, IgG levels are up high. So your risk assessment in that situation is very different. The risk assessment here was because of this specific patient population, and that made it a different uh, situation, and then your control measures were, uh, were different. So, So the point I wanted to make is that actually risk is very uh, context uh, dependent and in general people are not very good in analyzing risk. They tend to take decisions swayed on an emotional response to a situation rather than an objective assessment of relative risk. And um, there is a way actually to, uh, if you are very structured in documenting risk and analyzing your risk, and then also structured in uh, uh, assessing your risk, then actually you can improve uh, this, um, this you can improve this process. And what you see here is an, uh, a way to sort of semi-quantify your uh, analysis and your assessment, because you can have, as shown earlier today, you can put in uh, levels of the risk, uh, a scale 1 to 5, I would say a scale 1 to 3 would uh, very much average out uh, uh, your risk assessment. I mean, then there's only choice of three. You can uh, ask five people in your surroundings, clinicals, clini clinicians or yourself, uh, to scale it. So you get a number of uh, uh, reports and then you can uh, graph it like this. And what you see here is that... Um, the scale of probability goes from very low to very high, and it's uh, scaled with a number, a 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. And here, the scale of impact is very low to very high, and you number it 1, 2, 2 4, 8, 16. That's a choice. It's purely ar arbitrary. You can take any choice. But the reason why it's doubled here, actually, is that the impact of something which probably occurs very, very low uh, but it has a very high impact, you still are in a red area. So if you scale them t uh, equally, one, two, three, four, five, then you, lever, you uh, average out. So also where you put your border, if you're going to do only the red dots or, or you, are you going to do the yellows also, that's also arbitrarily in your laboratory. So maybe harmonization, yes, or maybe... Um, Let's see how it uh, works out. And, um, but what I wanted to show you is that if you do this like this, in a structured manner, then actually, and that was yesterday, it was a devil's dilemma between quality, price, and uh, time. Well, here's a way to analyze where you should put your money and where you should put your time. Because if you do it like this, then you know what to prioritize in your lab. So this is what I wanted to say. Uh, thank you very much. And um, I hope it was helpful. Thank you both. We, um, we have a, a, a few moments for comments or questions, and then we'll move into a break. One, one thing that struck me about both, especially, um, well, and, and, and Dr. Barak's, uh, I, I thought to myself, 
you were talking about all of the things, the choices you're making in developing your QC plan, and I thought, where do you find the information? What guidelines are you using? Are you, is it so dependent on your own individual situation? And there are no guidelines. It's based on, on, on the clinical chemistry. I used to be a clinical chemist, and therefore I just adapted all the rules and everything that it, it, it seems that everything was considered in, in context of the clinical uh, information. Because if I'm using very, very tough rules and the clinic information that doesn't uh, uh, have any advantage of those rules, why to use them? And it's just trial and error, as I have concluded a little bit of a trade-off between science and the art. So what advice would you have for somebody in, in somebody coming in and they're sort of running that, that uh, department of the lab and they're looking at their, their quality program, where would they start? Uh, just to try to see if, if they can fulfill all the steps of quality control till the, 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 the internal control and then to the, to the patient, if they have enough patients to make quality control on the basis of the patients that is very useful. Just every one of the, of the tools of quality control to try to implement it to see if there is any benefit. Anne-Marie, I, I was uh, delighted to see that you, you've taken a stab at CLSI EP23 and doing that risk assessment. It's something that it's becoming, a, uh, it will become more important. Um, what were the first steps that you took in sort of taking that document and, and deploying it in your laboratory? Well, it, it was, it is helpful because it actually answers a question of why. Uh, and uh, very often you hear uh, quality controls uh, or, or uh, all, all sort of measures. We do it sometimes before accreditation, before, because of accreditation. I saw that coming by that answer also uh, here today or yesterday. And this is actually uh, the way to go because it's your why. Why are you doing it? And then you can uh, figure out uh, how you're going to do it in your lab. And I would say start with those tests which, are, uh, which you have to validate anyway, because if you're doing your validation protocol procedures, then at that time uh, it's a very uh, good uh, moment to also make your risk analysis. And I would say in time um, uh, your, your laboratory will be more based on risk analysis. If you start just in the blind and you, have t you think, okay, I'm going to do all my uh, um, uh, I'm going to do all my uh, tests uh, within straight away, then, then you have a tremendous job to do, yeah. Yep. That's a challenge we're facing in the U.S. right now is, is uh, labs that want to implement EP23 because it's, it's now become a part of, it, well, it's becoming a part of the regulatory requirements in the U.S. Uh, under CLIA. Uh, labs are faced with sort of the daunting challenge of how do I do this analysis for all of my examinations yeah. and all of my processes in the lab. So I, I think that's, a, that's great advice to start with, those that you need to validate. So any other comment or question from the audience? Okay. Thank you. We'll take a 20-minute break and return.